Okay, I want to thank everyone for coming today. And I also want to thank all the uh, viewers out, on, uh, out in internet land for tuning in and watching today. Uh, this is uh, lecture number five in the six part uh, climate change lecture series coming to you from fantastic Wave Street Studios here, uh, just a stone throw away from the beautiful Mon Monterey Bay, a short walk from the uh, famous Monterey Bay Aquarium, very close to John Steinbeck's Cannery Row, so historic location here. Um, last week we began discussion of technologies and practices for halting climate change. The first three lectures were about the science of climate change. We're going to finish up on that today technologies and practices. We're going to finish up talking about uh, drawdown.org. We spent a lot of time last week talking about drawdown.org. And uh, I want to move through that material fairly quickly because I have, I want to take a more forward looking uh, view towards the technology with regard to, for example, the things that Bill Gates talks about in his, in his book. And I also want to talk a little bit today before we leave about uh, geoengineering. So let's jump in with drawdown and just a quick review. Uh, Drawdown, Project Drawdown is the world's leading resource for climate solutions. It's a nonprofit organization that proposes, analyzes, and ranks solutions for reducing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere with the goal of reaching drawdown, the point at which uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases begins to decline on a year-by-year -year basis. Um, it was founded in 2014 by Paul Hawken, currently headed by Jonathan Foley. Presents about 80 solutions for reducing greenhouse gases. We looked at about half of them last week. We're going to look at the rest today. Uh, organized into nine sectors, two scenarios. We're going to be looking at scenario two, which is uh, hold global warming by the end of the century to one and a half degrees centigrade, which is the most uh, stringent recommendation of the Paris Accord. Uh, it includes analysis of global costs and return on investment. We'll take a, another look at that at the very end here. And Drawdown essentially provides a roadmap for stopping and eventually reversing global warming and climate change. So just quickly, these are the nine project drawdown sectors. Uh, these are oriented towards reducing emissions of greenhouse gases. These are focused on protecting and enhancing the ability of the natural world to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. This is all about developing artificial means to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And finally, as we talked about last week, this is about limiting global population growth. So these are the three sectors we will consider today. Transportation, buildings, and land sinks. So first of all, transportation. Public transit. Streetcars, buses, subways offer alternative, efficient modes of transport. Public transit can keep car use to a minimum and avert the emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And uh, public transit will, can account for about 1.47% of the total solution of what we need to do to get to 1.5 degrees warming. As we go through this, just like we did last week, you can kind of focus on this number down here, which is the percent of CO2 reduction required to hold uh, 2100 warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. The average solution with these 80 solutions is 1.25%. So you can see public transit is a little bit above the average here. Electric cars, pretty obvious, about 1% uh, of the solution. Efficient trucks, uh, about 0.6% of the solution. Efficient aviation, I'm sure we've all seen you know, the various configurations of winglets on various jet aircraft. That's all about making them more efficient. Engines are continually being made more efficient. New materials making them lighter. Those are all things that are going on and need to go on that uh, can account for about uh, six-tenths of the percent of the solution. Carpooling, pretty obvious what goes on there. Something we should all try to do. About a half a percent of the solution, totally. Uh, bicycle infrastructure, I know the city of Monterey, the city of Salinas have been uh, taking steps in this direction. The whole idea, of course, is to hold down uh, vehicle use. Efficient ocean shipping. Um, these are ship tracks here, I, probably about a, over about a one-year period, the kind of thing that uh, my Fleet of Miracle colleagues and I used to look at quite a bit. And there's lots of opportunities for um, fuel savings there, more efficient ship design, onboard technologies, operational practices with regard to ship routing, avoiding severe weather, taking advantage of ocean currents, all those kinds of things can be done to um, uh, reduce the emissions associated with shipping. Walkable cities, again, the idea is to try to induce people to uh, not use their cars, but rather walk. Hybrid cars. Um, hybrid cars are um, an important thing, not quite as good as electric vehicles, but certainly part of the solution. Electric bicycles, 
A lot of fun, by the way. If you ever tried electric bicycle, they're a lot of fun. And they're on the rise. I'm seeing them more and more around. So electric bicycles are a good thing. Telepresence. You know, I, you know, some of my colleagues and I have been on many, many video conferences over the years. And pretty painful when we first started doing that. But it's, telepresence is getting better and better. You know, more bandwidth, more realistic, you know, feeling like you're there. So I think that's a, you know, it's a technology which is going to really help. Cuts down on travel, especially flying and, and the emissions associated with that. High-speed rail. Um, high-speed rail is extremely efficient. High-speed rail offers an alter alternative to trips otherwise made by car or airplane and can dramatically curtail emissions, particularly um, used very heavily in Japan, for example. Electric trains, also very efficient. Uh, enables trains to dispatch with 30 diesel burning engines. And when powered by renewables, electric trains can provide nearly emissions-free transport. So that was the whirlwind tour of the transportation sector. Um, globally, transportation is not that large. And we looked at that uh, in a lecture or two ago. Only about 14% of emissions, whereas in the US, it's much higher. In fact, the highest sector for emissions in the US is transportation. We drive a lot. We have a lot of cars, a lot of wide open spaces. But globally, it's actually only about 14%. Next up is buildings. Now, this might seem odd to you. Improved clean cook stoves. And it's actually a significant part of the overall solution, 4.58%, which is really, really quite large. And the idea here is that there's actually about 3 billion people in the world that are cooking every day on very primitive stoves and burning wood, charcoal, animal dung, crop residues, and coal <clears throat> in traditional stoves. And um, lots of times there's incomplete combustion and that sort of thing. And lots of CO2 is being put into the atmosphere. And just simply by bringing um, to bear some pretty simple new technologies and improving these, uh, these, these cook stoves, that can produce a, a, a large part of the, of the necessary solution, 4.58% here. Insulation, pretty obvious. obvious. Want to keep um, buildings you know, warmer and, and lower the amount of, of energy required to heat and cool them. LED lighting, I love LED lighting. I've got LED lights in my house. You know, it's a little bit of upfront investment, but you know, they're extremely efficient. And you can just demonstrate that to yourself by going out and buy some LED lights. Solar hot water. Um, the idea here is you're warming the water without going through the, the electricity part of it. And it uh, can, be, can be very helpful, about 0.9% here. High performance glass. Uh, this is like, sort of like insulation, and it makes building, heating, cooling more efficient. And of course, it minimizes unnecessary energy use and curtails emissions. Building automation systems. This is like your automatic thermostat, but applied to you know, buildings. It can control heating, cooling, lighting, and appliances in commercial buildings, and uh, cuts emissions by, uh, by uh, maximizing efficiency. 0.66% of the overall solution. District heating. District heating is um, where you have uh, you know, several large buildings um, close to one another on, say, a city block. And rather than having each building have its own heating system, they share a common heating system. And uh, that makes it much more efficient. A central plant and pipe network channel hot water to many buildings with lower emissions than individual on-site systems. Kind of an economy of scale kind of thing. 0.62% of where we need to be. Biogas for cooking. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, composting and biogas generation. Anaerobic digesters produce you know, either backyard or, or farmyard organic waste into biogas and digestate. Uh, digestate is a fertilizer. Biogas stoves can reduce emissions when replacing biomass or kerosene for cooking. So that's actually a fuel that can be used in cooking. High efficiency heat pumps. Heat pumps extract heat from the air and transfer it from indoors out for cooling or from outdoors in for heating. With very high efficiency, they can dramatically lower building energy use. Smart thermostats. You know, some of us probably have those in our houses right now. Pretty obvious what they do. Cuts energy use, low flow fixtures. Water takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to, to, to transport it, to heat it, and um, you know, by minimizing water use, of course, we're in the middle of a drought here in California. We, we want to minimize water use anyway. But uh, that can contribute to minimizing CO2 emissions. Green and cool roofs, it's a pretty small part of the solution. But uh, in the right you know, location, they can make a big difference. 
The uh, green roofs use soil and vegetation as living insulation. Cool roofs reflect solar energy. Both reduce building energy use for heating and cooling. And of course, in California, we have that thing called the Cool Roof Initiative, which uh, you may have heard about. Certain, certain areas, you, you, know, you, you have to uh, have certain types of roofs. Water distribution efficiency, pretty small, but nevertheless um, part of the solution. Pumping water requires enormous amounts of electricity. Addressing leaks in water distribution networks, especially in cities, can curb water loss, energy use, and emissions. Dynamic glass, this is kind of like your sunglasses, that, your glasses that turn dark you know, when you go out in the sun. Same idea here. And the idea is to uh, reflect the sun, keep the sun out of the building, and minimize cooling costs. <clears throat> So finally, land sinks. Tropical forest restoration. This is huge, 5.36% of the overall solution. Uh, tropical forests have suffered extensive clearing, fragmentation, degradation, and depletion of biodiversity. Restoring these forests also restores their functions as carbon sinks, and they are very important carbon sinks in the world. You've probably heard about the Amazon. I, I, you know, I I'm probably get this wrong, but you know, it's something like a, you know, a soccer field every. 30 minutes is being cleared in the Amazon, you know, some, some huge amount. Being cleared for, um, to a great extent around the world, particularly in the Amazon, being cleared for um, uh, growing palm oil, you know, which has become a big product. And as, that, uh, as those the trees are being cleared, that reduces the, uh, the carbon sink, which is an important part of the, the global carbon cycle. So tropical forest restoration is a big part of the solution. Silvopastures, now what the heck is that? Well, it's an agroforestry practice. It's a, silvopastures integrate trees, pasture, and forage into a single system. Incorporating trees improves land health and significantly increases carbon sequestration. And I think you can tell from this picture that it makes the cows pretty happy because it looks to me like these cows here are pretty happy. The whole idea is you're, you're bringing trees into the pasture and it, 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 it significantly increases the amount of carbon that's sequestered into the soil. Tree plantations on degraded land, degraded pasture and agricultural lands or other lands corrupted from overuse such as mining are ripe for strategic planting of trees and perennial biomass. Managed well, uh, these tree plantations can restore soil, sequester carbon and produce wood resource in a more sustainable way. And that's a pretty big part of the solution, 2.2 per 6, 2.26%. Perennial staple crops are things like bananas, avocados, breadfruit. Uh, compared to annual crops, they have similar yields but higher rates of carbon sequestration. So perennial staple crops are a big part of the solution. Temperate forest restoration. Uh, almost all temperate forests, this is forests that are you know, in the mid-latitudes, have been altered in some way. Almost all have been either uh, timbered, converted to agriculture, or disrupted by development. Uh, restoring them sequesters carbon and biomass and soil. So basically, you know, taking, taking care of the natural world is what this one is all about. Uh, managed grazing involves uh, carefully controlling livestock density and the timing and intensity of grazing. Uh, compared with conventional pasture practices, it can improve the health of grass on soils, sequestering carbon. Tree intercropping. Um, Growing trees and annual crops together is another form of agroforestry. Tree intercropping practices vary, but all increase biomass, soil organic matter, and carbon sequestration. You can kind of see that you've got crops here kind of interspersed with trees, and they kind of work together synergistically, and it's a good thing. Bamboo production. Bamboo is, is, a, is a great, um, is a great uh, plant. It uh, rapidly sequesters carbon in biomass and soil and can thrive in degraded lands. You can pretty much plant bamboo anywhere and it's going gonna, it's gonna to thrive. And also long-lived bamboo, pr bamboo products can store carbon over a long period of time. So bamboo is an important part of the solution. Multi-strata agroforestry. And you can kind of see what it looks like here. Multi-strata agroforestry systems mimic natural forests and structure. Multiple layers of trees and crops achieve high rates of both carbon sequestration and food production. Abandoned farmland restoration. Uh, degraded farmland is often abandoned. How does it get degraded? Well, overuse of fertilizers, overgrazing, that kind of thing. Um, restoration can bring these lands back into productivity and sequester carbon in the process. Perennial biomass production. 
bioenergy, which we're going to talk about a little more here before this talk is over, um, relies, bioenergy relies on biomass, often annual crops such as corn, a perennial plant, plants such as switchgrass, silvergrass, willow, eucalyptus, are a more sustainable source of energy than fossil fuels and sequester modest amounts of carbon in the soil. So we've gone through all 80 drawdown solutions. <laughs> so now I'm, pretty quickly. And by the way, I strongly advise you to, um, you know, if you're interested in learning more, go to uh, drawdown.org. It's an excellent website. You can really drill down there and find out in each of these solutions, really find out a lot more information about them. Also, you can find about how they do their economic analysis and so forth. But I want to leave you with sort of the, the ranking of the top 20 drawdown solutions. So here we go, number one to number 20. Number one is offshore wind tur or, sorry, onshore wind turbines that we talked about last week followed by utility scale solar voltaics, in other words, uh, you know, solar farms. Reducing food waste is number three. Remember we learned that um, we throw away about, the world throws about, away about one third of the food produced, and that's, that's actually number thir three on the solution here. Um, Plant-rich diets, trying to get away from that meat into the spectrum to the plant into the spectrum. Health and education, which is keeping down uh, global population growth. Tropical forest restoration, clean cook stoves that we just talked about. Distributed solar voltaics, that's rooftop solar. Two, two here dealing with um, refrigerants, refrigerant management and alternative refrigerants. That has to do with those F gases, those fluorinated gases we learned are such powerful, powerful and long-lived greenhouse gases. Trying to keep them out of the atmosphere is so very important. Silvopastures, we just learned about. Peatland protection and rewetting. Peatlands are bogs and they, they, they're very efficient at uh, sequestering carbon. They have huge carbon stores. We just talked about tree plantations, undergraded lands, perennial staple crops, temperate forest restoration, managed grazing, tree intercropping, concentrated solar power is that those things out in the desert where they use all the mirrors to concentrate the solar power into a tower and then run a turbine, public transit we just talked about, regenerative annual cropping. So you can see with just these 20 solutions, we actually get about se almost 75, 74% of the way to where we need to be to achieve the Paris goal of 1.5 degrees of warming by the end of the, holding the warming to 1.5 degrees by the end of this century. And the remaining 26% um, is brought about by the, the, other, the remaining 60 solutions. So these are the top 20 and these are the big ones here. And I just want to once again talk a little bit about the cost. We talked the same slide we looked at last week, just want to hit it one more time. By the way, I have to issue an errata here. When I talked uh, last week and I talked about the need to um, eliminate the um, uh, subsidies in, in the fossil fuel industry, I made the statement that the U.S. is the world's largest exporter of oil. That's not right. What I meant to say is the world is the largest producer of oil. We produce more oil than any other country. Saudi Arabia is the largest exporter of oil. We're, we're third in terms of exporting of oil. Russia is second, at least before Ukraine. They probably will drop down the list and will probably become this, the world's second largest exporter of, of oil. And the question then, of course, is why are we subsidizing the fossil fuel industry, the, the, oil, the huge oil companies that are so successful um, after all these years? You know, we started subsidizing them back during the oil crisis of the 70s. And those subsidies and those tax breaks are heavily embedded in the tax code. And that's a future policy challenge, making that go away. Anyway, the point here is for, for um, scenario two, whole global warming to one and a half degrees centigrade, the annual cost to the world over the next 30 years, this is, the whole thing is geared to a 30 year implementation period, is about one trillion per year. So $30 trillion over 30 years, which is about one and a quarter percent of global GDP. That's highly doable. Um, and the, the, the point is, there's a huge return on investment. And if you want to know how you figure that out, you can look on the Drawdown website and and dig down into that. And that is a true return on investment. It's not cost avoidance. This is not money that comes back because we're assuming there's going to be fewer hurricanes and fewer damage. This is actual cost savings, replacing a coal-fired or, or gas-fired um, power plant with a wind farm or a solar farm, things like that. Huge savings, about a five to one return on investment. If you prorate the global cost over by uh, GDP, then the cost to the US would be about 250 billion per year, which is not that much. About 1.1% of, of US GDP and significantly less than what the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, says the fossil fuel industry is currently subsidized 
at by the US government. Now, I have a little, I'm, I'm not terribly confident of this number. Like I said last week, the uh, fossil fuel industry will tell you it's much lower. Environmental groups will tell you it's much higher. I chose the IMF as, as perhaps a, you know, a honest broker here. But I'm not terribly confident of this number. But what I am confident of saying, it's hundreds of billions of dollars. Hundreds of billions of dollars. Does the US government write a check to ExxonMobil in Texaco every year for hundreds of billions of dollars? No. It comes to, the money comes to them through tax breaks and subsidies, you know, oil fuel depletion allowances, um, tax deductions for drilling new wells and things like that. Okay, that's the whirlwind tour of Drawdown, uh, Project Drawdown. And by the way, you can download this, this uh, book in a PDF form from their website. It's called Drawdown Review. They, had, they came out with a, a, a New York Times bestseller um, about four or five years ago. It's just called Project, or just Drawdown. Paul Hawken was the author. And it was on the New York Times bestseller list for quite some time. Uh, this is an update to that. This is sort of the new version. It came out a few years ago. I think it came out in 2020. And it, um, it's an updated version, drills down a little bit deeper. It's free. You can just download it and really dig in there and see how they do their economic analysis and that sort of thing if you like to do that. One thing I mentioned last week, I want to reinforce here, Drawdown is focused on technology that exists now, technology that can be applied now. They don't take a forward-looking view of what's coming down the pike 10 years from now, 20 years from now that can be applied to this problem. They will eventually address such technologies when it gets ready for prime time. They're really focused on technologies that are available right now that can be applied. But I want to talk about future technologies. And a really good source of that is Bill Gates' book, which came out about a year or two ago, uh, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. Gates brings the perspective of a businessman and an entrepreneur to the problem. Um, he takes a forward-looking view of the technology, and he speaks often about the need to align markets, technology, and policy. It's the businessman speaking there. The need to reduce green premiums as much as possible. What's a green premium? Well, it's how much you spend ab above and beyond what you would normally spend uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, avoiding carbon emissions. For example, um, you're going to um, uh, you're going to um, buy jet fuel for your airliner, for your airline business. You buy traditional fossil fuels, or you can buy synthetic electrofuels, which we're going to talk about here in a second. Well, you're going to spend a lot more. You're going to spend probably on the order of four times as much. That means airline tickets go up. There's a big green premium there. You're going to buy a, um, you're going to buy a Volvo um, uh, XC40. And um, you can either buy the Volvo XC40 gasoline powered or XC40 recharge. Well, you're going to pay a lot more for the electric version of that car, even though everything else is very much the same. So that's what the green premium is. And the idea is we really need to reduce the green premium. And, and Gates talks a lot about that. A lot of it has to do with economy of scale, growing the economy. And you know, as things, things build out, you know, prices will go down. And finally, he talks a lot about the need to innovate, innovate, and innovate. He's an innovator. And he basically says, we can innovate our way out of this problem. There's lots of things that need to be, that can, we haven't even thought of yet. Lots of R&D, lots of research, lots of, lots of m fortunes to be made. You know, it's kind of like the early days of the computer industry when he invented Microsoft. There's lots of you know, new technologies out there waiting for people to find. So he's really kind of pushing for that. Uh, and I want to talk about some of those technologies. Now, these are technologies that um, uh, Gates talks about in his book. By the way, there's a lot of overlap between what Bill Gates talks about and Drawdown. Because Gates talks about existing technologies, but then he goes beyond that and talks about the future technologies. So I want to talk now about some of the future technologies. Um, and the first one I want to talk about is called Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage, CCUS. So the idea here is that there are machines that can be uh, placed at um, power plants or manufacturing facilities, and they can ca capture the CO2 before it hits the smokestack. And then it can be put into a pipeline system, which is being built out around the country. It can be shipped to a site where it can then be pumped into the ground into, through impermeable rock down into um, deep, deep uh, underground geologic formations, such as sandstone, um, under this impermeable rock. And then it, and it's sequestered there. It can be held there. But in addition, that captured CO2 can be used by other uh, uh, factories to build things useful. Uh, such as, you know, cement, plastics, even uh, vodka, you know. 
And then finally, um, it, that CO2 could be pumped down into the ground to enhance the recovery of oil in depleted reservoirs, which would then allow oil that would otherwise not be able to be brought to the surface to come up. And that's actually not a good thing. We don't want to do that. We want to leave that oil in the ground. Uh, but that's part of this. Part of this, and the reason why it's part of it is uh, it was part of the Future Act, which passed a few years ago with huge bipartisan support. Uh, the Democrats like all this part, and the Republicans like that part. And the reason why it was able to pass is because it had this part in there. But that's not the, that's not what we want to do. We want to leave that fossil fuel in the ground. But unfortunately, that's that's part of the part of the deal. Direct air capture. Now, this is an artist's rendering of a device that would. Um, actually capture carbon dioxide right out of the air. Uh, this di device does not exist anywhere in the world, at least not on this scale. There are about a dozen or so examples around the world of direct air capture, and they're kind of like mini versions of this. And it does work. It's very expensive. But you can extract carbon dioxide from the air. You can then you know, utilize it. You can store it. You can do those kinds of things. Um, it's never going to be a huge part of the solution, but it's going to be an important part of the solution. We'll, we'll see here in a second why. I will mention that it was just uh, announced, just a matter of, I think, in the last week or so, that as part of the infrastructure bill, which I'm going to talk about next week, part of the uh, climate issues and infrastructure bill, there's $3.5 billion that has been uh, relegated to developing four direct air capture hubs within the US. So there's going to be some building out of direct air, ca direct air capture. Yes, Maribel. Before you get too far from the Bill Gates stuff, mm -hmm. do you agree with him that we're going to innovate our way out of this problem? You know, we don't even really need to innovate out of, out of the problem. You know, what I'm going to say when I wind up this series next week is we have the technology to solve the problem right now. We have, we have everything we need right now to solve the problem. Uh, we just lack the, the political power and the political will to do it. But we have, enough, we have enough time right now. The science tells us we have enough time. And the technology says we have what it takes to, to do what we need to do. But we're not doing it. Or not, at least we're not doing it fast enough. But innovation is good. I'm not saying so you don't need to innovate. We do need to continue to innovate, because that'll make it easier. There'll be new things coming along that'll, that'll be good, like, like direct air capture here. So uh, like I, I said, the, the, direct air capture is not going to pull all the CO2 of the atmosphere and solve this problem, because it's just far too expensive. But it can play an important role. And um, the important role it can play is in conjunction with electrofuels and biofuels. And Bill Gates talks a lot about that in his, in his book. And it starts like this. You begin with um, clean energy, for example, from wind, from solar. And with that electricity, you electrolyze water to produce green hydrogen. Now, remember in high school where we had that experiment where you had the electricity and you had two test tubes and you know, one bubbled up hydrogen and one bubbled up oxygen. That's what we're talking about here, producing green hydrogen. It's not really green. It's, it's clear. You know, it's just plain old hydrogen. It's because it's made from green energy. So we have green hydrogen. And that's a first step here. Well, with green hydrogen, we can actually fuel airplanes. And there are airplanes that are being designed now to be, to be uh, fueled with hydrogen. Um, hydrogen has a higher energy density than the, the best jet fuel, about three to one. So if you're going to um, you know, fly a, a, a jet airliner on liquid hydrogen, you're only going to need about one third of the fuel if you're flying on Avga or jet fuel because it has about three times the energy, energy density. That's why they fuel rockets like the space shuttle goes. They use liquid hydrogen. That's the good news. The bad news is you've got to keep it really cold. You've got to keep it liquefied. So there would have to be new infrastructure at the airports, a lot like the infrastructure that's at Cape Canaveral where the rockets are launched to keep that fuel uh, cold. Uh, you, you have to develop you know, new engines and, and you know, new airplane designs. But that's all going forward now. And um, I'm pretty confident that um, you know, in 20, 30 years, you know, if you're going to fly to London, it's going to be on a hydrogen fuel airplane. So that's the first thing. And oh, by the way, you could use that hydrogen fuel cells as well. Fuel cells could power you know, you know, trucks or cars and that kind of thing. But then you combine that hydrogen you know, right here with CO2 that you get from the air, 
from uh, direct air capture. And this is what these two things are supposed to represent. We're pulling CO2 out of the air with direct air capture like we were looking at a minute ago. But also, uh, you know, carbon capture. This would be the, the, the first slide we we're looking at, capturing carbon before the smokestack. You can take that CO2, combine it with the hydrogen you've gotten from here with some more clean energy, putting into a couple of different types of reactors, and you can produce electrofuels. For example, DME, dimethyl ether. Dimethyl ether is a, is a diesel replacement. So you can replace diesel. You don't have to change the engine at all. You can replace uh, diesel with DME. Uh, you can run, you can produce gasoline, ethanol, et cetera, et cetera, just by using clean energy. And then when you combine that with biofuel production, and biofuel production here, the idea is CO2 is being taken out of the atmosphere, again, not by direct capture or uh, capture at this, at this chimney, but rather by plants and biomass. And from that biomass, you put it into a biofuel production facility and you come out with biofuels such as methanol. Then you can use those biofuels to run long haul trucks, uh, ships, airplanes. You know, we can, we can synthesize, um, as I mentioned before, you, we can synthesize aviation fuel and use the planes we have right now and fly them um, you know, off these electrofields. So you're saying, well, they're still emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, so what's good is that? Well, it's really, really good because we actually have a closed loop here. Because what's happening is, yes, when we fly the airplane, sail the ship, drive the truck from these electrofields or biofuels, yes, we are emitting CO2, but it's just going back in the atmosphere and it's being recycled. It's a closed loop and we're simply recycling it. And um, what we're doing is using the fuel to concentrate the energy into a very dense, and the energy ultimately is coming from the sun through the photosynthetic process. But ultimately, we're using um, these fuels to have a very high density container for the energy, so to speak. And it can go right into planes, ships, and trucks. Closed loop over the long haul, CO2 in the atmosphere will not go up because it's a closed loop. What we're doing now is rather than having this closed loop here, there's another arrow that goes down here into the ground, and we're pulling up, we're pulling up fossil fuels, burning up those fossil fuels. And yes, the CO2 in those fossil fuels came from the atmosphere, but it was the atmosphere 200 million years ago. And we're taking that CO2 from 200 million years ago when those fossil fuels were laid down in the age of the dinosaurs, and uh, now we're putting in the atmosphere, and that's why the CO2 is going up. But this will not cause CO2 to go up. This is a closed loop. We're just recycling the CO2, and this is sustainable in the long term. Pumped hydropower. Now, this is actually not a new technology. This has been around for some time. It's kind of fun to talk about. But I think it's going to become very important because, as we talked about last week, the big issue here is we get so much energy uh, during the daytime from solar. But what do you do at night? Well, you've got to store that energy. And typically, it's done with batteries. And of course, we talked last week about the world's largest battery energy storage facility here at Moss Landing, pretty close by. Well, another way to do it, and in fact, a very efficient way to do it, is called pumped hydropower energy storage. So it works like this. <clears throat> During the day, when we have excess electricity because we have so much solar power and we have a you know, huge amount of excess solar power in California, uh, that is used to turn a, um, a turbine, electric turbine, which pumps water from a lower reservoir up to an upper reservoir during the day. And then at night, when the sun goes down, we need to get the energy back. That water, we reverse the process. The water runs back down just like any hydropower and it and it in the and what was previously a turbine and previously a pump becomes a generator and that electricity then goes back out to the grid and uh, the storage efficiency here is very high it's like a, in the 80 plus percent range so if you put in uh, you know you know 100 megawatts you get back 80 megawatts you know that kind of thing very efficient so i'm i'm, I'm imagining we're going to see a lot more pumped hydropower systems out there. There are a fair number are out there now in Tennessee and in um, Colorado. There's some in California, I think in New York. It requires water and it requires, it requires a little bit of topography. You gotta, you gotta be near a mountain or, or at least a pretty good sized hill to make this work. But I think it's a, a, good, a good technology to help us deal with the, the intermittency of, of uh, clean energy. 
High voltage direct current, HVDC. This is something uh, which is, has a lot of um, sort of global implications. Um, I'm sure you all remember the story of, of, of uh, Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison. You know, you probably heard that story. Um, Tesla was a, was a um, protege of Edison, worked in his lab there. Edison was a proponent of direct current. This was in the early days of electrification. Of course, you know, even a light bulb and all that. And they were starting to build out electricity in cities. Edison was a strong proponent of direct, of, of direct current. Tesla was a strong proponent of alternating current. And the idea there was the direct current had you know, major losses of, and transmission losses, such that at the kind of voltages they were able to achieve back then, you would pretty much need a, a, a power generating station in every neighborhood because you couldn't transmit much farther than beyond a neighborhood. Well, ultimately, AC ran it, won out, of course. You know, it, it, very quickly, it became clear that AC is the way to go because we can transmit over you know, fairly large distances and we can't have a power station in every, in every, um, in every uh, neighborhood. So Edison fired Tesla. Tesla ended up a pauper, didn't work out too good for him, but he had a car named after him, so he's, he, is, he is remembered for that, and that's great. So here's the thing. The story doesn't end there, um, because if you look at the efficiency of transmission, indeed, for the kind of voltages that were achieved back in those, those, those days, um, yes, uh, alternating current is much more efficient than direct current. However, when you start to move to very, very high voltages, and we're talking about voltages in the range of of millions of volts. Typically now, you know, um, the kind of transmission lines you see around, they're in the hundreds of thousands of volts, but now we're talking about mil going to millions of volts. There's a crossover point where DC becomes much more efficient than AC. And if you go to several million volts, maybe tens of millions of volts, DC becomes extremely efficient, extremely efficient. So efficient that you could, act you could actually transmit power, eventually transmit power intercontinentally. When, and there's some really significant geopotential implications of that. I'll talk about that in a second. But certainly, you can transmit power very efficiently across the entire United States. And this is what a proposed um, uh, HVDC um, network would look like. These would be um, AC, DC converter stations. The, the big lines here, the blue lines here, that would be high voltage direct current, millions of volts. And at these nodes here, the uh, voltage would be stepped down and the DC would be converted to AC and it would go on to the regular power grid. But the advantage of this is, you know, you can balance the load out much more efficiently around the country. For example, you know, what if the, the uh, you know, what if the sun is not shining and one's not blowing in California? Well, it's probably blowing and, and probably sh shining someplace else. And you can export that energy there and, and vice versa. So you can, you can much more uh, readily and widely balance the load on the power grid using uh, high voltage direct current. I mentioned intercontinental, intercontinental um, transmission. There are no examples of that yet, but I have to believe at some point that will be possible. The Chinese are big on this. Uh, the Chinese have put in an HVDC network uh, ahead of everybody else, and it goes across the entire country of China, by the way. It wouldn't be a stretch to imagine eventually they could run those networks out to other countries. So um, imagine if China suddenly had a breakthrough in energy. You know, for example, they suddenly had a breakthrough in, let's say, nuclear fusion. And suddenly they were able to undercut the prices of everybody else in the world in, in electricity. And oh, by the way, they have an HVDC network that allows them to send electricity to every country in the world. Well, guess who would dominate the world? That would be China. So uh, we need to keep the United States competitive in this area. We need to keep the United States competitive in new technologies like, like nuclear fusion, which we're going we're to come to. Which brings me to the topic of nuclear power plants. As I mentioned last week, uh, Drawdown is not very enthusiastic about nuclear power plants. They kind of say, well, we kind of have to keep them going, but small part of the solution, we don't really want to build them out. Gates is much more forward thinking on that. Uh, he's also uh, an investor in, in nuclear power plants, and he's very upfront about saying that I'm investing in these different companies, Terra Power, and you know we're trying to build these fourth generation power plants. So th the point is, all the existing nuclear power plants that are in operation around the world are second and third generation plants. All the first generation plants are gone. They're second and third generation plants, 
And there's, there's something called Gen 3 Plus. There's just kind of, but it's really pretty much the same design. Generation 4 uh, reactors are a set of nuclear reactor designs currently being researched for commercial applications by the Generation 4 International Forum. And there's about a half a dozen different designs. They're motivated by a variety of goals, including improved safety, sustainability, efficiency, and cost. In my judgment, this is just me talking here, uh, Gen 4 nuclear power plants significantly mitigate but do not completely eliminate the problems of Gen 2 and Gen 3 plants, which are risk of catastrophic failure, production of radioactive waste, risk of nuclear weapons proliferation. So let's take a look at that. Well, first of all, these are, these are some of the designs. And um, you know, some of them use thorium rather than uranium. A big advantage there is a thorium, the, the, um, the um, nuclear waste doesn't stay radioactive as long. And so you have less of, an, of a storage problem. Many of them operate at atmospheric pressure as opposed to very high pressure. That's because they use things like molten salt, liquid sodium for cooling rather than water. And as a result, they don't have to operate at very high pressure. That makes them inherently much safer. Many of them use designs that um, just from the basic laws of, of physics, if the reactor starts to overheat, um, you know, things will move apart from thermal expansion and the re reactor will start, to, will start to shut down. So they're inherently safer. Um, they don't have as nearly as bad a nuclear waste problem. Some of the designs don't produce any weapons grade, any fissile material for nuclear weapons. That's the good news. The bad news is all designs can be modified very easily to produce fissile material. So it doesn't make that problem go away. It, it, does, it does mitigate it to a degree. Um, so let's see here. So now we come to uh, nuclear fusion. And just a quick review from our high school physics here. Fission is the splitting of a large atom into two smaller atoms. That's how all existing nuclear power plants work. Fusion is the joining together of two or more lighter atoms into a larger one. Both of these processes release, release nuclear energy. This is fusion is how the stars work, for example, how our sun works. So nuclear power plants based on fusion would avoid the problems associated with existing power plants, all of which are based on fission. That is, fusion plants would avoid the risk of catastrophic failure. Uh, unlike a fission plant, it's really hard to get a nuclear fusion reaction going, and it's super hard to keep it going. Things go wrong, it just shuts down. So uh, that really minimizes the risk of any kind of catastrophic failure. They do produce a small amount of radioactive waste, but it's nothing nearly on the scale of the problem of, of uh, fission plants. And finally, there's no risk of nuclear weapons proliferation. There's, they don't produce any type of fissile material. Now, a fuel would simply be isotopes of hydrogen, which can be obtained in abundant supply from seawater and the element lithium. Thus, fusion-based nuclear power plants could produce a virtually limitless supply of non-polluting carbon-free electricity. The problem is, achieving nuclear fusion requires heating the fuel to temperatures comparable to those at the center of the sun, about 100 million degrees centigrade. And actually, they, they, because we can't achieve the pressures, it's a question of temperature and pressure, because we, because we can't achieve pressures comparable to the center of the sun, we actually have to achieve temperatures higher than the center of the sun, about 100 million degrees centigrade. And of course, there are no physical materials that can withstand such temperatures to contain the fuel. And this kind of leads uh, to a famous quote, and that is, a nuclear power plant based on fusion is only 30 years away, and always will be. You know, 30 years ago, they said it's 30 years away. You know, it's like a moving target. But the fact of the matter is there has been progress made. And in fact, there has been a, what I believe to be a breakthrough. And I'm really happy to report that it, that breakthrough occurred in the US at MIT. And we're gonna talk about that in a second, it's really good. So how do these things work? Well, they work, um, they, there's no material can hold the uh, material together. There's no material that can hold the, the fusion uh, elements together. So they use a magnetic field. The, the most common uh, design for a fusion-based plant is based on what's called a tokamak. A tokamak is like a donut. Imagine there's a donut here, and the inside of the donut is actually, this is like a cutaway. And this thing about this is being the inside of the donut here, right? And plasma gas you know, circulates around there. Where the whole of the donut would normally be is there's a super powerful magnet, and the magnetic field loops out here, and it keeps the plasma. plasma 
is a state of matter where uh, it's so hot that the electrons and protons and neutrons are all completely disassociated from atoms. They're just a soup of particles flying around. And it's in that soup of particles flying around that the fusion process occurs, 100 million degrees centigrade. And they're kept within this donut, this tokamak here, by a super strong magnetic field. Now, there is an international collaboration involving China, the European Union, UK, India, Japan, Korea, Russia, and the United States to build and operate the world's largest tokamak. Uh, it's designed to prove the feasibility of fusion as a large scale and carbon free source of energy. There are tokamaks out there, the, the machines out there that work on this, and, but, but the problem is right now I think the world's record for energy out compared to energy in is about 0.6. So you put in 100 megawatts of energy to make this thing work and you only get 60 megawatts out. And obviously that's not going to work. In fact, to have a viable operational commercial power plant, you need to get about 10 times as much out as you put in. You put in 100 megawatts, you need to get 1,000 megawatts out to make it a viable plant. And uh, the ITER is designed to produce that tenfold return on energy, or about 500 megawatts of fusion power from 50 megawatts of input power. But this project is not actually going to produce any electricity. It's just really designed to try to get this ratio up to show we can do a 10 to 1. And, uh, and then the next step after that would be trying to turn it into a commercial power plant. Full operations of the ITER machine, which, I, which is, I believe it's being built in France, are expected in 2035, so you know, still pretty good ways away. And it's a huge machine. In fact, if you look very closely, if you see this little orange, that's, that's a person right there. That little icon it represents a person, that little orange figure. So you can see it's a huge device, very, very expensive. And uh, that's kind of one approach being taken here. Now, the breakthrough I mentioned is uh, at MIT, in conjunction with a, a MIT spinoff called Commonwealth Fusion Systems, they have um, employed uh, new technology, electromagnetic technology, electromagnet technology, that allows them to increase the um, magnetic field by about two to three times over what's being achieved at ITER, and in a much smaller package. This is the um, this is what the tokamak would look like for this. Um, proposed system called ARC. This is a person right here. So you see it's not that big. And this is the inside of the donut here, the magnet is in the middle here. And this system is actually being designed to actually produce electricity and put it out on the grid. So this is not just a demonstration. This is to actually produce electricity that goes out on the grid. Uh, the magnetic field is about two to three times stronger than the ITER field, about six times stronger than the most powerful MRI, just to kind of set the scale there. Could be fielded early in the next decade, perhaps before the ITER project is, is finished, and expected to produce a net output of about 230 megawatts, enough to power about 150,000 average sized homes. It will be informed by SPARC, which is a prototype reactor. It looks a lot like this, but it doesn't have all the electricity generation. A joint project between MIT and Commonwealth Fusion Systems, and they're working on that right now. It's being built. There's a, there's a I forget the name of the town, but there's a town in Massachusetts where they have a big campus, and they're actually building out the system right now. So I think that's really good. I think I, for a long time, I was worried that the US was falling behind in fusion. Uh, there was a time where it seemed like the UK was in the lead, the Europeans in the lead. I have to always worry about China on things like this, particularly when you think about that HVDC technology I'm, I mentioned. But uh, I think that the US is, is making good progress here, so I'm really happy about that. OK, the final thing I want to talk about is geoengineering. And before we talk about that, I'm going to take you back to this slide. And you were probably hoping you would never see this again. I kept showing it over and over again. Well, it's back. And um, once again, this is the Earth's energy budget, averaged over the entire face of the Earth, averaged over all four seasons, averaged over a long period of time. And we learned uh, in earlier lectures that the Earth's energy imbalance, EEI, which is depicted right here, is the key parameter. That's what drives global warming and climate change. And EEI is just uh, the incoming solar radiation measured in watts per square meter minus the reflected solar radiation minus the outgoing long wave radiation. If you total those numbers up like that, you find that uh, the Earth is warming at a rate of about 0.9 watts per square meter. That's, the, the, that's what's causing the global warming. There's this in, in radiation imbalance here. Now, let's round these numbers out. Uh, let's round up 101.9 to about 100 watts per square meter. 
and let's round 0.9 here to about one watt per square meter. So what that means is if we just achieved about a one, about a one percent, roughly a one percent increase in the reflected solar radiation, that would bring down the Earth's warming rate close to zero. We would solve the problem. If we can just increase the reflected solar radiation by 1%, we can solve the global warming and climate change problem. Which is effectively saying if we can just increase the albedo of the Earth by about 1%, remember we talked about albedo as reflectivity of the Earth, on the average it's about 0.3, 30%. If we can just go from, you know, just increase that by 1%, um, then we could bring the rate of warming and, and stop climate change. So that's what pretty much all geoengineering is oriented towards this, solar, solar radiation management, SRM. And it's, almost all of it is geared towards trying to increase the Earth's albedo and cool the Earth as a result of that. So I'm going to show you sort of the six um, most popular, most talked about um, technologies or, or proposals that have been put forth. So this is the sun here, not drawn to scale. And these are the rays of the sun. The first one is, is the idea is send giant mirrors into orbit around the Earth. Now, you're probably going to say, you are probably be laughing like that. Come on, get, get serious. Well, um, maybe, maybe this is practical. Um, you know, when we think of mirrors, we think of something heavy like this glass here, you know, like the mirror that's in our, in our house. But a space-borne mirror could be made out of mylar film, which basically weighs nothing. Um, now you have to deploy it once it's launched up there, and that's not a trivial thing to do, but it worked pretty well for the Webb Space Telescope they just you know, did last a few months ago. Uh, and of course, space launches are getting less and less, and you know, just 1% is all we need to change. So that's one idea. What are the negatives here? Well, um, you know, there's a lot of space junk up there now. This would be putting a lot more space junk up there. And whatever you put in orbit, it doesn't stay up there forever. Orbits decay, and eventually it comes down, and eventually it'll burn up in the atmosphere. It's not going to hit anything, but then you have to relaunch again. So you know, whether this is practical or not, I don't know. But it's one of the things that are being looked at. Second idea is to release reflective aerosols into the stratosphere. And you could do that with uh, planes flying, you know, jet airplanes flying at high altitude, or even tethered balloons, um, putting either particulate matter or um, sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere. And that will certainly work. And we know that from what happens with volcanoes. When volcanoes erupt, they put a lot of material, a lot of volcanic ash, up in the stratosphere. It'll typically stay there for about a year. And that causes the Earth to cool. There's the famous uh, year without a summer, which occurred after a, a very large volcanic eruption. So there, it's a proven fact that you know, putting aerosols up there will cool the Earth. Uh, but, the, but like all geo geoengineering proposals, the questions are, number one, is it scalable to the size we need to have the impact we need to have? Number two, what's it going to cost? Is it cost effective? And number three, what are the unintended consequences? You know, we put particulate matter up in the stratosphere. You know, it's eventually going to settle down, and then we are eventually going to breathe it in. It's just like air pollution. You know, um, if you remember the global warming curves we looked at in some of the earlier lectures, there was that period of time. There was that fairly rapid warming right about to the, till the beginning of World War II. And then the temperatures actually declined from the beginning of World War II to about the um, early 70s. And that's because pollution was, was going up globally so much. Uh, from the war effort and then from the post-industrial economic boom. Beginning in the early 70s, we started worrying about pollution, started passing laws to clean up our act, and, and um, you know, air pollution went down, but the masking effect that was, was masking the effect of, uh, or the uh, aerosol cooling effect that was masking global warming went away, and global warming really took off in the 70s. So this does work, but there are certainly unintended consequences. That's something we worry about for all these geoengineering proposals. Next one is cloud thinning. Um, I talked a little bit earlier, just barely mentioned it. Cl low clouds, like the marine stratus we have off the coast here of Monterey, uh, exert a cooling effect. High clouds, like cirrus clouds, are way high in the atmosphere. They actually exert a warming effect because they pretty much let the sun through, but they trap outgoing infrared radiation. So the idea would be if you can thin um, the high cirrus clouds, then that would exert a cooling effect. So the idea here is you would use drones or perhaps other aircraft to um, do cloud seeding at the high levels to try to thin, uh, thin, the, thin or remove the cirrus clouds. Next is um, trying to increase the albedo on the land surface. For example, you could do some genetic engineering to produce shinier crops that would be more reflective. 
And uh, of course, you can paint buildings with white roofs, that kind of thing. Again, we're only talking about a 1% change is all we need to make here. Um, this is an interesting one. Releasing micro bubbles from ships at sea to, uh, you know, you've probably seen a ship wake, it's, it's white. Releasing micro bubbles into the ocean with maybe drone ships that are out there that would become more reflective and uh, increase your salpedo. This one, which is, it, it is um, it's called cloud whitening. This might be the most viable one of these. I think, you know, the, the idea here, you, you've got a drone ships that are unmanned and possibly, you know, powered by the wind or waves. And they actually, uh, what they do is they spray sea salt from the sea surface, from, from the uh, seawater up into the clouds, into the marine stratus clouds. And um, that has the effect of changing the uh, cloud droplet sizes, and it actually causes them to become wider and more reflective. And there have been you know, research studies done on this. They've actually demonstrated this capability. Question is, you know, is, it, is it scalable to, to the point where it would make it a, a difference, and what would it cost? So that gives you a flavor for um, you know, the um, uh, geoengineering issues, and again, the, the real issues are cost, scalability, and what are the unintended, unintended, unintended consequences. Geoengineering is a bit of a controversial issue. There are many climate scientists that say, hey, we don't really want to talk about this. We don't really want to pursue this uh, because you know, it'll give people a thought that there's a silver bullet out there, that someone's going to invent some new technology or technique, and as a result, fix the problem. We can just keep on drilling. We can just keep on burning fossil fuels. And that is certainly not the case. Um, there's no silver bullet here. My personal opinion is research should go forward in all these areas. But whether it actually ends up being deployed, I think, is an open question. I do worry about the unintended consequences here. So that's it for today. Closing comments. Um, you know, thank you so much for being here today. And, and many of you have been through all, all these lectures. We've now covered uh, five. And we, we did three on science, two on technology, and next week we'll be on um, policy, kind of bringing a lot of these things together. So thanks so much for uh, coming here today, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> Open for questions and discussion. We have a person with a microphone right over there. Yes. Do you know, are there any under construction or even close to that phase at this point? China has uh, announced plans to field two operational, which means on the grid, no kidding, producing electricity, uh, Gen 4 plants by the end of this decade. So they're probably in the early stages of construction and design now, um, no doubt about that. Russia claims to have a Gen 4 plant, a sodium cool plant. I don't believe it. I don't believe it's really a Gen 4 plant, but it's in operation now. So, um, you know, that's kind of where that stands. And I think, I think other uh, countries are, are probably pursuing, you know, that as well. I know, as we mentioned in earlier lectures here, um, France has really embraced nuclear power heavily, and so I would expect they're probably going to be pursuing Gen 4. Mm -hmm. What else? Mike's on. Okay, I'll repeat the question then. Okay. Okay. Uh, other, qu other questions? Yes. The, um, the albedo geoengineering is to decrease the albedo. Increase. Increase. Yeah. And so, there is, isn't there a positive feedback loop where because of the fewer, you know, ice and, and snow? Yes, so, absolutely. So it's kind of fighting that as well. At the That's same right. Time. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. And we talked about that in one of the earlier lectures. It, it's, called, it's called the snow ice feedback effect, and it's one of the most powerful effects. And, and the idea there is um, as the Earth is warming, sea ice is melting in the Arctic. And uh, when it melts, it leaves behind dark ocean. And that has the effect of decreasing the Earth's albedo and more warming. Also, uh, less snow is left on the ground, in northern, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. We have a lot of land because of the warming. And as a result, in summertime, there's more heat absorbed by the land. And it just keeps building on itself, positive feedback effect. And it's, uh, that's a, it's a 
very important. It, it significantly amplifies the, the, the warming effect of, of the CO2 in the atmosphere. But one thing we learned about um, in the earlier talks is that feedback loops require some external forcing to get them going. You know, a feedback loop is just going to sit there and not do anything unless you push it in one direction or another. But if you don't push it, it's just not going to do anything. It's just going to sit there. But you know, the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere is pushing it towards warmer conditions, and that causes the, C the feedback loop to activate and warm. Uh, it goes the other way, too. Positive feedback amplifies the warming, but also amplifies the cooling. So if we were taking you know, CO2 out of the atmosphere and that forcing function was pushing the Earth towards cooler temperatures, that feedback loop would go the other direction and amplify the cooling. That's what positive feedback loops do. And the geoengineering is, you know, you know, like I said, pretty much all of the um, major geoengineering initiatives are oriented towards trying to reduce the Earth's albedo. And it doesn't, you know, fraction, you know, one one percent change can make a make a big you could solve the problem. Even a half a percent would half the problem. So that's kind of what motivates people to look at it. But again, uh, you worry about cost, scalability, unintended consequences. And the real concern is that people will say, well, well, someone will come along and there'll be a silver bullet. They'll fix this problem. We don't really have to stop drilling for, for fossil fuels because there'll be some other solution out there. And I'm very confident that's not going to be the case. What else? Yeah, it didn't look yes. like any of those possibilities. I mean, it's, it seems like most of them are in the same category as fusion. Maybe 30 years from now, maybe it'll do something, but it didn't seem like any of them were, were on the near-term horizon. Yeah, so the question is, were any of those geoengineering issues on the near-term horizon? I think the answer, I think you're right about that. I do know there is a project called the, the um, um, cloud whitening project, and it's based, I believe, at University of Washington. I think the PI is there. It's an international effort, and they actually have done some stuff off of Monterey. They've actually uh, done some field experiments off Monterey, where they've had a research ship out there, and they've they've probably used some device to, you know, lift salt, you know, to put salt crystals up into the base of the cloud, and then from satellite they measured, how, you know, how it's changed. So that kind of research is going on, but that's as you're quite right. That's a long way from having you know, a fleet of drone ships out there that are actually making a difference. You know, will it ever get to that point? You're right, probably 20, 30 years away. Mm -hmm. I bet Maribel has a question. I don't. <laughs> I didn't see the windmills included in those options. That's because they're existing technology. I was really kind of looking at future technology. Um, the windmills, though, when we went back and looked at the top 20 drawdown um, solutions, onshore wind turbines, you know, land-based wind turbines are actually number one. They're at the very top of the list. They're doing well. Yes? Okay. I was a little um, confused when the telepresence. Yeah. Um, I guess we're so used to it due to our inherent work. It's Jeff. I didn't recognize you were. Okay. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> I was a little perturbed that it wasn't couldn't account for a larger yeah. percentage. But I guess we're in such an environment where we take it for granted, and that is not the norm. Yeah. When you consider nine billion people on the planet. Yeah. You know, it kind of comes back to the business about transportation. Globally, the transportation sector is only about 14, 12 to 14 percent of emissions. In the U.S., it's like 28 percent. You know, you know, we're used to a lot of emissions with regard to transportation, but globally, you know, people don't drive as many cars, fly as much as we do. And also, most of the emissions in the transportation sector are not actually planes, not, not actually, um, you know, people flying from here to there. It's actually driving on the highway. It's cars and it's and it's trucks and buses, you know, on the highway. The aviation part of it, which is kind of what telepresence addresses, is um, you know a, a small part of that. Uh, let me tell a little scenario here, or a little um, anecdote here. Uh, one time, a few years ago, well, more than ten years ago, um, had opportunity to go up and visit Cisco Systems up in in Silicon Valley, and uh, it was a group from the Naval Postgraduate School went up there, and they kind of gave us a VIP tour of all their un upcoming technology, and they had this. You know, super video conferencing capability, where um, 
you just kind of sat at a table, and there was kind of a screen here, and you were at a table, and you were looking at the screen like you were looking across the table, and the people you were seeing on the screen were in another room. It could be across the country. But the resolution was so incredibly high. And of course, the bandwidth had to be super high to make that happen. That's kind of what they were talking about, you know, Cisco technology to enable this kind of bandwidth. You felt like you were really there. I mean, you felt like you could reach out and touch the person. It was just amazing. I think when we get to the point where we have that kind of technology, where you know it's not just looking at a TV screen up there, but rather there's a whole wall, and you feel like you're in the room with people, then and you can you know multiple people can be carrying on conversations at the same time at this wall, even though the other people are 2,000 miles away. I think when that happens, that really is going to be true telepresence, and you know there'll be a decline in airline travel for sure. I mentioned that partly because I have a good friend, for instance, who lives in Salinas, mm -hmm. and he works in Silicon Valley. Yeah. So it's an hour and a half each way. Mm -hmm. So with the pandemic, his company decided to go telework, and voila, three hours of driving in a car a day goes by. So uh, it, it has the, I'm not sure how that is factored into the numbers that, that you Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, the numbers that we talked about there and, uh, from the drawdown part, part of this talk uh, were pre-pandemic. You know, they've not updated things since the pandemic. Life has changed after the pandemic. And a big part of that is exactly what you've mentioned, the fact that people are, are telecommuting much more than driving. And uh, probably will continue to do that you know, even after the pandemic is completely gone because you know there's big advantages in doing that. So. Um, you know, telepresence could very likely grow to be a bigger, bigger part of the overall solution for sure. You know, along those lines, there was a report on the national news just last night about travel, and they commented that business travel was actually ramping up pretty quickly, which they were a little surprised at. But a lot of people were quoted as saying that the personal touch and the direct contact is really important in a lot of fields. I guess. Sales and things, mm -hmm. and but but your uh, your Cisco wall may may yeah. finally get around that if and when. Yeah, you know I, I think you know I, I well we all had to travel when we worked for the Navy, and lots of times it was really nice not to have to make a, a trip, but on the other hand you know it was never the same as being there when you're looking at a TV screen up on the wall, but eventually you know I think it's going to become like you feel like you're really there, and when that's the case. Um, you know, it, people are going to want to take advantage of that. Could you speak at all to the difference? I thought that all these cars were all electric, but is there some difference between the Prius kind of electric and the Tesla kind of electric? Well, there's, they're, they're hybrids. They're plug-in hybrids, and they're all electric. You know, a hybrid, you know, has a, a electric motor and a gasoline engine, and um, you know they're more efficient than a pure gasoline car. You know when you're driving around town, you're going to be running on electric power, and and the car is automatically charging the battery when necessary with it with the gasoline-powered engine. The next step up is plug-in hybrid. It's just like the regular hybrid, but you can plug it in and charge that battery up, as as opposed to having your your gasoline engine charge the battery up. And then all electric is you know you take the gasoline engine and throw it away, and it's purely electric. Now. Um, Tesla is just one brand, you know, just one automaker. There are many, you know, different uh, electric vehicles out there. They're all pretty much based on the same technology, electric motors and lithium-ion batteries. You know, you can take your take your pick. Which ones do you think are the best? And, and is one more or less advantageous to the atmosphere? Electric are the best. You know, the the best way to go here is is have an electric vehicle and charge it uh, with uh, with your rooftop solar or other forms of, of green energy. And uh, you're pretty much zero emissions at that point. And again, the ranking is, you know, let, all electric is the best, plug-in hybrid, and then hybrid. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jeff. You mentioned, uh, Mike, um, the astounding fact that burning wood coal in, uh, around the globe, mm -hmm. 3 billion people are using that. Mm -hmm. And if my memory serves me correct, Gates and company have, as part of their foundation, have led several efforts to replace that with things like solar-powered uh, stoves. 
Yeah. I don't know more about that. I think Mirabel does. I don't know anything else. <laughs> that has been a comment. Aside from the use of the wood burning stoves, mm -hmm. you're cutting down the wood, which is yes. an energy or CO2 sink. Exactly, that's true. And in some cases, you're using coal, you know, which is the worst situation. Uh, I'm not familiar with those details. I, I know uh, Gates, the Gates Foundation, you know, does a lot of humanitarian stuff all around the world. They're really focused on, you know, helping uh, less advantaged people. And um, you know, the d distributed photovoltaics is part of that. You know, they're part of the drawdown solution. That's not just rooftop solar, but also. Um, you know, uh, solar panels that are used for applications like that, particularly in developing countries. Mm. Yes? Are you, um, with the newer generation nuclear power plants, mm -hmm. are we seeing a reduction in risk of nuclear you know, radioactive disaster? Are they safer? Radioactive disaster. You know, I'm glad you bring that up. Let me just uh, quickly. I thought I had a slide on. <laughs> I thought I had a slide on um, uh, disasters. Let's see. Hang on one second. This is going to be a preview of next week's lecture. You people are really fortunate. You get to hear this part twice. <laughs> now and again next week. <laughs> I, I sort of see four problems with um, generation two and three nuclear power plants, the ones that are in operation right now. The first is the possibility of catastrophic failure. And um, here are three examples. This is one you've never heard of, the Mayak nuclear site in Russia. Two undisclosed nuclear accidents, one in 57, one in 2017. Uh, both of them released huge amounts of radiation that Russia did not acknowledge, and other countries eventually realized that was going on there. Of course, you know about your Ch Chernobyl. Here's the you know destroyed reactor. You know you probably remember when you, when Russia invaded Ukraine, they stirred up set the ground there in Chernobyl. Lots of radioactivity was still there for all this time. This is what the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant power plant looked like shortly after the um, tsunami. It's not good when you have a nuclear power plant on fire like that. And oh, by the way, you probably read in the news recently that they're running out of storage for the, the water. They're, they're, they've been having to keep the, the reactors cool by circulating um, seawater through there. That seawater becomes radioactive, and they put it in these big storage tanks. And they've, they're running out of space. In fact, I think they already have run out of space. And so they're releasing that radioactive water into the ocean. And that was a, a, that's a big concern for a lot of people. So there's the possibility of catastrophic failure. Now, a nuclear proponent is going to say, hey, wait a minute. If you look at the number of terawatts produced by, nuclear power, by the nuclear industry and the number of people killed in these disasters, the number of people killed per terawatt, it's the safest power out there. It's safer than wind. It's safer than solar. You know, People fall off wind turbines all the time. It's safer than hydropower because there was a huge dam collapse in China and killed thousands of people. If you look at the number of deaths Per terawatt, nuclear is the safest. Wrong metric. That's the wrong metric. It's not how many people die in the initial accident. It's what it does to the land. You're going to take, you know, if you have, um, you know, a, a, a Chernobyl-style disaster, you're going to turn the land, um, thousands of square miles of land, uninhabitable for centuries. For example, if we had a nuclear power plant at Moss Landing and they had a Chernobyl-style uh, failure, you're going to be evacuating for centuries all the way from Santa Cruz to Big Sur to Hollister, and you're never going back. That's what, that's what that would do for you. So, oh, by the way, you know, people down in um, San Luis Obispo County and people up in Santa Clara County, they're going to start dying from cancer at anomalously high rates. And they're going to claim in court that, um, you know, it's because of the radiation, the low level rate exposures or low level radiation exposure they're getting. So you think about radiation, it doesn't, it kills, it kills slowly. Um, not that many people are going to are die in the initial accident because, you know, you have time to, to evacuate the Monterey Peninsula when the plant blows up in Moss Landing. But over a period of time, people will start dying at anomalously high rates. Can you prove that in a court of law? Well, it depends on how good your lawyers are compared to the legal dream team 
that, will, that the power company will field against you. Good luck with that. So that's the first thing, possibility of catastrophic failure. The second is the storage of nuclear waste. The waste from these plants is radioactive for tens of thousands of years. For a long time, the, the, the right answer was, or, or the answer was, and I felt it was a very good answer, was uh, Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Repository in Nevada. This is what it looks like. It's this, this big region right here. Here's what it looks like underground inside Yucca Mountain. Um, and it was going on pretty well. You know, it was being built out, and I was kind of keeping up with it. It was really interesting science in designing these storage facilities that last for 10,000 years. But then about the mid-2000s, the people in Nevada rose up and said, not in my backyard. And so they put a halt to it. So ever since uh, the mid-2000s, Yucca Mountain has been in a caretaker status. It's been in limbo, essentially. Uh, it's not shut down, but it's not going forward. It's not st st storing any nuclear waste. It's just sitting there. And I'm not expecting that's going to change. You know, you know, no, no one's going to come in and say, hey, I'm, I'm running for president, and oh, by the way, I want to put a bunch of nuclear waste in Yucca Mountain here. Well, you're going to lose Nevada if you do that. And Nevada is a purple state now. So no president or presidential candidate is going to say, we want to reopen Yucca Mountain. So what's happening is nuclear waste is being stored at the sites. Every nuclear power plant stores the weight it produces. And it pr stores it in these huge canisters here. They're, they're, they're steel and concrete and forced canisters. It's holding this high, high level nuclear waste, going to be reactive, radioactive for 10,000 years. This is not a sustainable solution. You know, these things aren't going to last for 10,000 years. Not a sustainable solution. So that's a big problem. Storage of nuclear waste. Third problem is nuclear weapons proliferation. If you own a nuclear power plant, then you have a path to nuclear weapons. Now, I'm not worried about PG&E launching a nuclear strike on Florida Power and Light. Although, who knows? But I am worried about countries like North Korea. And indeed, um, North Korea obtained its nuclear arsenal. And most people, it's pretty widely reported, they have a couple of dozen uh, atomic bombs. They obtained their nuclear uh, arsenal from um, reprocessing spent fuel rods in their nuclear power plants. So if you own a nuclear power plant, you have a path to nuclear weapons. And that's exactly why the Israelis attacked the Iraqi nuclear power plant in 1981. This is an artist's rendition of that. And why in 2007, the Israelis attacked a Syrian nuclear power plant. So you know, if you're going to have a proliferation of these power plants, you're going to have the possibility of countries are going to be attacking each other's power plant to put them out of, out of business. Because if you have a power plant, you have a path to nuclear weapons. And the final problem is uh, Gen, Gen 2 and, and 3 nuclear power plants are very expensive. The, their, their, their power is actually by far the most expensive power on the grid. This is called levelized cost of energy, cents per kilowatt hour. And this is ba basically the break-even cost of producing electricity. So what you do here is you take um, you know, the total cost of the power plant from cradle to grave, including decommissioning cost, and then um, you know, take that cost, divide by the total number of kilowatt hours produced over that 30-year life cycle, and you come up with what's called levelized cost of energy. That's a way to intercompare the cost of different sources of power. And you can see that onshore wind, number one and drawdown, is by far the cheapest power on the grid. In fact, it's the cheapest power in the history of the world, no doubt about it. But nuclear sticks out like a sore thumb. It's really up here. It's, it's you know, four times as expensive as onshore wind power. And that's because, um, you know, that's because nuclear plants are plants are kind of one-off designs. Um, they're huge. It, it, it takes a long time to build them. It takes a long time to, to decommission them. Um, you have to engineer a huge amount of safety into them because of the possibility of catastrophic failure. So they're really expensive. Um, and then we could go on and talk about the Gen 4 plants. So those are the problems that exist with existing nuclear plants. And as we're going to talk about next week, this is going to be what I think will be the biggest policy challenge for your generation going forward. What are we going to do with nuclear power? Big issue. What else? Hey, we've gone kind of long here, so I think we better bring it to a close. Thanks so much for paying attention and, and all the great questions, and I really appreciate it. I hope you'll join me again next week, and I hope those of, you out, those of you out there in Internet land will join me again next week. It'll be the final lecture. We'll be talking about policy to kind of pull it all together. Thanks so much for your attention.